Good morning, Chairman, uh, Ranking Member Slipinski and Johnson, and members of the subcommittee. Uh, very much appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today. What I thought I would do, since we've had some very capable uh, uh, examinations of what NIST can do and the direction uh, of its work, I want to close the testimonies by turning to some fundamental rationales so we remember uh, uh, what we are doing here. So I, I first want to consider uh, uh, why manufacturing actually matters so much, why federal policy support is warranted, and then what that might look like. And I'll touch at the very end on a few comments on HR 1422. I'll just, let's consider first, you know, why manufacturing matters. Uh, and on this front, I'm going to be very brief, but I'm going to put it in a, a broader uh, economic uh, context. Uh, you know, and I think my group since about 2008 has been arguing uh, uh, very much against the view that there's nothing special about manufacturing, which only four or five years ago really was uh, uh, a frequent uh, refrain. And motivated by the view, though, that, that since the 2008 crash, we needed to rebalance the American economy away from consumption and imports financed by foreign borrowing and back towards creating real value through innovation, export, and outcompeting other nations. So we've argued that manufacturing certainly matters, not just for the 11.5 million jobs left in the sector, but equally importantly because it's a major source of technology innovation and because it can make a major contribution to reducing the nation's trade deficit. Uh, you know, manufacturing is only about 11 percent or so of GDP, but it's responsible for the overwhelming majority, about 68 percent of it, of domestic R&D spending mm -hmm. by companies. This is the main site of innovation uh, and technology innovation in the private sector and in the whole economy. Um, at the same time, we've noted that manufacturing exports are going to be essential if we're going to be reduce, if we're going to reduce the trade deficit. Uh, uh, it's theoretically possible to uh, eliminate the trade deficit by increasing export and reducing the import of services, uh, agriculture products, and national, nat natural resources, but the task would be much easier if manufacturing were included. So if we want to reduce the deficit, uh, the trade deficit, we need to bear down on manufacturing. Let's return to whether or not uh, manufacturing is an appropriate object of policy attention. I'll just say there are sound economic reasons for engagement beyond the simple values of manufacturing that we've heard about from my, my co-panelists. Too many uh, economists, perhaps many of you here today, uh, 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 there's the sense that uh, any type of preferential treatment for a single type of investment is off base or distortionary. However, it's essential to remember that standard economic theory justifies government action where there are market failures, meaning situations where the societal benefits or positive spillovers of an, act, of an activity exceed the private return. In those situations, it's unlikely that a private business will invest at the optimal level. Hence my view, the U.S. manufacturing sector is plagued by a number of market failures uh, that merit government attention. Here are a few of these that pertain to uh, th uh, this morning's discussion of H.R. 1421. Manufacturers underinvest in collaborative public-private road mapping exercises because the collaborations are hard to organize and because they can rarely reap the full value of the association in their individual bottom lines. Manufacturers, even small ones, also underinvest in R&D because they can't reap the full value of technical advances in their profits. It's the classic example of positive spillovers. And then finally, mapping again into aspects of the bill, manufacturers, especially, especially small ones, often lag in, in identifying or adopting or developing the latest training and education models. The inability of firms to capture all the benefits, again, means they're producing value for the economy, value for the society, but not always uh, uh, profits to themselves. So in each of these instances, the implication is clear. Fundamental market values uh, ensure the nation will underinvest. So what kind of pro policy actions make sense? Uh, it's important to note that manufacturing policy should not pick winners, but, and it should improve the overall macro environment, but it also needs to 
attack these uh, market failures. So some of the general uh, aspects, and I think I've been running over just a little bit, uh, you know, increase public investment in R&D, improve the nation's tax competitiveness, especially for R&D and capital equipment, foster trade, invest in the nation's STEM workforce, modernize infrastructure, uh, you know, safeguard the nation's energy, windfall of unconventional uh, natural gas. But then policies that attack these particular uh, market problems can be very helpful. And I think that's what this bill does quite uh, skillfully. Uh, we like the idea of challenge grants that catalyze both a, that make available a grant, but catalyze the partnerships between sectors, business, academia, uh, and national labs. And I think you have a number of those in this. Uh, I could talk some more uh, about some of the other uh, uh, aspects of the bill, but I think the fundamental use of competitive grants here is a very important model for engaging uh, industry and getting them out front in determining and shaping uh, the interventions. So we can, I can go on later in questions, but uh, that's the basic outline. Thank you.